I was sitting in a nightclub in the financial district. A gigantic man with a shaved head and a Mike Tyson S tattoo on his face was studying my bare feet with the light of his iPhone. Nice arch, he said, but you won't get a lot of money wearing a dress like that. Most of these girls don't dress so uh, fashionably, he said, clearly thinking of a socially acceptable way to say non sluttily You can go home if you want. I would not go home. I'd gone all out, flat ironing my hair, putting on a ton of makeup and a flimsy little slip dress. In short, dressing like I was going on a first date, during which I intended to put out. <laughs> I'd walk down the gravelly streets of lower Manhattan in strappy stilettos, which ate the heels down to pointy stubs in a few short blocks, and I'd borne the leers from the construction workers along the way. Furthermore, I managed to find the balls to make my way down here, past the fake wood paneling of the foyer, which had promptly destroyed any hopes I'd held um, that the cl this club would be high-end, which is what I'd been told. Then down the stairs, I was not scared off by the greasy smudges that had somehow found themselves blemishing the mirrored ceilings and walls, or the fact that the floor was so sticky that my steps made smacks as I walked. I told myself the stickiness was due to spilled semen, not soda. Sorry, <laughs> reverse that. I was going to stay, and I was going to make money, even if most of the other girls around me were wearing the kinds of bras and panties whose sole function was to be promptly removed. I didn't care what he said. I am bad at basic life skills, like budgeting, and I was living off financial aid checks that came twice a year, so now I was completely and totally broke. Not because I needed to be, but because every semester, those thousands of dollars rolled into my checking account, and I found it necessary to boost the economy by buying books, makeup, dinners out, and clothing from little boutiques in Soho. Like a broke-ass grad student like myself even has the right to so much as enter a little boutique in Soho. Yeah, so I'm an idiot. I was currently living off oatmeal and dollar frozen burritos. Plus, I had to figure out how to pay next month's rent, and I had to do it fast. So I did what any resourceful young woman would do. I got on the gig section of Craigslist. <laughs> this particular section of Craigslist is a very special place where everything is not quite what it seems and nothing is good as it sounds. A headline that, trans that says, independent female looking for a partner, actually translate to, prostitute without pimp looking for her same to team up for safety reasons. <laughs> One says in all caps, humiliate yourself. This gig is actually totally non-sexual and is looking to attract people to sell comedy tickets in Times Square. <laughs> there was a time that I thought I wanted to be a dominatrix until I asked a friend in the business and she explained that the job entailed inserting enemas, pissing on people, giving hand jobs, and putting clothes pens on old man balls. <laughs> My friend insisted I was much too sensitive to do such a job and at first I was insulted. <laughs> but then she explained, Juliet, get real for a second. You got fired from that bottle service job because you couldn't stop body checking the drunk guys who tried to grope you, she said. Pissing on someone? I can see you doing that. <laughs> Touching an old man's balls? I'm pretty sure you'd rather clothespin your eyelids. Trust me, you wouldn't be able to put up with this shit. Sadly, she was right. I kind of also wanted to be an erotic nude model, a sugar baby, a stripper, to clean apartments naked and do basically everything else listed on the Craigslist gigs that involve being seedy, naked, and female, but isn't straight up prostitution. <laughs> These jobs seem like easy cash as well as an interesting experience, and I've always been into interesting experiences. So much so that my life has been filled with and punctuated by a whole stream of events that most people call bad decisions. <laughs> Things like dating someone who is fresh out of prison, smoking meth, driving down the freeway at 120 miles an hour while drunk at 6 a.m., and moving to New York City when I had 30 days sober and the only two people I knew there were junkies. Oh, no. Nick. Yes, I am impulsive. Yes, I've always had an intense and deep-rooted self-destructive streak. But these bad decisions had more to them than that. I'm an emotional ex extremist and experienced adventurer. I want to live as much as, and as intensely as I possibly can. As Iggy Pop says, I've got a lust for life. And as Iggy explains, a lust for life can be dangerous. But I also wasn't stupid. Self-destructive, yes. Suicidal, not anymore. 
And the aforementioned situations were potentially quite dangerous, the stuff of newspaper headlines and Dateline specials. And yes, while I do enjoy being sexualized and looked at as an object, I am also a giant control freak, and I want to be able to manage who is doing this as well as what they think of me. I mean, sometimes I really enjoy being called a slut, but I am only comfortable being called this by a very special kind of man. <laughs> and in these Craigslist scenarios, there are no guarantees on any of the things that I cared about. There were simply too many variables. But I'd gotten clean almost exactly a year before, and now I couldn't even remember the last time I'd broken a law. I felt like a good girl. I felt boring. I had no idea who I was anymore. I wanted to go back to making bad decisions. I wanted to go back to having extreme experiences. There's only so much healthy living that can be done before healthy living turns painfully predictable. So when I saw an ad to work at a high-end foot fetish club that paid $400 a night and didn't involve touching above the knee, I jumped right on it. <laughs> this was the kind of sexual objectification of strange experiences that I could get into. I emailed Jeanette, who was listed as the contact at the bottom of the ad, and sent her my photo and phone number as requested. I also told her that my feet were size six and a half, and I had a freakishly high arch. She answered back immediately. <laughs> and now I was here. By the time I'd filled out the paperwork, a release form, and an agreement to not give out my phone number or meet any of the clients outside the club, my nervousness had lessened considerably. By the time the man inspected my feet, I was calm and I was in it. I was ready to have another weird experience. A group of Indian businessmen walked in. They looked scared, but I could feel their eyes sizing me up. It was an uncomfortable feeling because I knew I was being evaluated, but I had no idea if I measured up or even if I wanted to. As a group, they moved to the end of the bar, not talking yet to any of the women. The room filled up. As the men walked in, they looked us up and down in a way that made me feel like potential property. I would have preferred they just shined their phones in my feet. None of the men looked like people who I'd be okay with sexualizing me. Then a black guy with dreadlocks walked in, sat down next to me, and ordered a Heineken. After a little small talk, we went and sat together in a dark corner. The deal was this. You were supposed to collect $20 for every 15 minutes. The men were supposed to tip you on top of that. It was up to you to keep track of the time. At the end of the night, you tipped the club out a flat fee of $80. You got to keep whatever was left. The man handed me a 20 and wasted no time in taking off my shoes. He rubbed my feet against his face and moaned. I love it when they're a little moist, he said. <laughs> I didn't know my feet were still sweaty. I didn't know that having sweaty feet could be attractive. I loved finding out that people can be so fucking weird. <laughs> the human experience, it's vast and it's strange. He shoved my foot into his mouth, as much of it that would fit, and I was surprised by the wetness and also by how much of my foot he could fit in there. <laughs> his mouth was very big and soft and stretchy, and it seemed like he was trying to eat me. <laughs> I'd never had my foot that far in anyone's mouth before. He did some more weird shit, like rubbing my foot against his face, making me squash his nose with my toes. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to be, like, moaning in pleasure or something. Mmm, I said to try it out. <laughs> Soon enough, the 15 minutes were up. The guy stood and acted like nothing had happened. Have a good night, he said. He didn't leave a tip. I toweled off the dreadlock man's spit with dis disinfectant wipes, as instructed, and put my shoes back on. I expected to feel dirty or soiled in some way, but aside from feeling creepy about acting turned on, mostly I just felt curious. I had no idea that men wanted to treat my feet this way. Uh, where was I? Sorry. Well, I had no I desire to imagine all the boner popping going on, this whole thing wasn't half bad. The objectification seemed to be mostly confined to my feet, and also it was weird as hell. Unsure of what to do next, I stood next to a pole in the center of the dance floor, wishing I still drank so I had something to do with my hands. I knew time was money. Men kept looking at me, their eyes traveling from my face, down my body, and landing, yes, at my feet. But whenever I'd look at them, hoping to make eye contact, hoping to make some sort of connection, their eyes would quickly flit away as if they'd never been trained on me at all. 
Clearly, I was going to have to be aggressive. I spotted this bald guy in a suit who kind of reminded me of Charlotte's husband in Sex in the City, the one who isn't Kyle McLaughlin. He looked okay, not too slimy, and so I walked over to him. Hi, I said. I gave him the smile I make in pictures. I led him to a booth that was well lit and out in the open. His name was Bruce. When he asked mine, I told him the fake one I had prepared, which was Sylvia, as in Plath. He's, he said he liked my smile. He asked if I did this often, and when I said no, he acted surprised. I thought you must have coming up to me like that, he said. This made me proud of myself. I was acting like a hustler. <laughs> Working with this guy was a lot easier. He asked me a lot of questions, which were easy to answer because I loved talking about myself. <laughs> While he did this, he held my feet, sometimes massaging them. Every once in a while, he would brush one of them against his cheek, but he never did anything truly surprising like attempt to shove all of one in his mouth. <laughs> Actually, the whole thing was rather pleasant. Bruce also told me about himself. He lived in Chicago, but came here on business fairly often to sell medical supplies. He liked my dress and my long black hair. I could tell you were artsy, he said. He said artsy in the same way that most men might say multi-orgasmic. Every 15 minutes, I asked for another $20. Each time he handed me a bill, I crumpled it into my purse. I felt rude, constantly checking the time and always asking for money, but that was why I was there, so that is what I did. Every 15 minutes, I asked for another $20. Oh, shit. <laughs> As we talked, I looked around at the rest of the nightclub. The lights were dim and red, and I felt like I was in a scene from Twin Peaks. All of the girls were with clients now. Sometimes they'd go behind the double doors in the back of the nightclub, in pairs or alone, with single or sometimes groups of men, which gave me the sneaking suspicion that this club wasn't entirely below the knee only. Almost all of the girls were blonde and tardy, leaving a girl who looked like myself, who was there almost solely for voyeuristic reasons, to stick out like a sore thumb. The clients themselves, though, were varied. A couple of Hasidic Jews, the Indian businessmen, lots of men of all ethnicities and ages, most of them wearing suits. In the booth across from us, a very pretty girl was having her hair brushed very slowly by a very old man in a wheelchair. She was smiling and giggling. After he was done brushing her hair, he took her feet in his lap and tickled them. She kicked her legs and shrieked. She looked like she was having a lot of fun. There was no money in this world that could get me to act like that. I was a little bit jealous. Toward the end of the night, Bruce said to me, let me buy you some shoes, whatever ones you want. Okay, I said. I was envisioning red-soled Louboutins, maybe a pair of Jimmy Choo's. At that point, I really didn't care about the no phone number exchange rule. A $2,000 pair of shoes could easily be stretched into two months' rent. I know this really good store, he whispered in a voice he probably thought was sexy. It's called DSW. <laughs> I gave him a fake phone number, but I was not surprised by his shitty little offer. This is a job I had found on Craigslist, after all, and nothing on Craigslist is as good as it seems. I made two fifty that night after tip out. A girl in the bathroom dressed like a naughty schoolgirl was complaining that it was so slow that night she'd only made fifty dollars. I asked her how much she normally made. Two hundred, she said. Four hundred bucks my ass. Still, I was happy when I got a call back for the next week. This could be my thing. I could totally make money doing this. I could be a foot slut. <laughs> I got dressed that night, just like I had the previous week. First my makeup, then my hair. The theme this time was bikinis, so it's easier to decide what to wear. But as I dug through my clothes, looking for my bikini, I started to think about standing there, wearing almost nothing this time, in the middle of that dance floor as men looked at me over but couldn't bring themselves to meet my gaze with theirs. Julius.